The Celtics Talk Podcast is presented by 24autogroup.com, 11 locations across New England. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the season opening Celtics Talk Podcast here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. Eddie Haas, I got, uh, I got like five burning questions that I need to ask you about the upcoming season, which we are incredibly hyped for. But let's just start big, big picture. Like, how are you feeling knowing tomorrow is the start of the NBA season? I feel good, man. The NBA is back. I think it's the most competitive season that we're going to see in a long time. Mm-hmm. You look at the West, how the West is loaded. Yeah, people talk about how top-heavy the East is. But there are some teams down there that's going to be able to make some noise. There's not going to be any mail-in games where you go in and you know for sure that you're going to get wins. There are going to be a lot of young and up-and-coming teams in the East with some, a lot of young talent. So this season is going to be extremely exciting, and, and I can't wait for it to start. Well, it's starting tonight, and then starts for us. And, and then it really starts tomorrow when we get to see this new look Celtics team with all the expectations and actually get to overreact to everything. All right, my, my um, first of my five burning questions to you. Who has the bigger impact um, among the newcomers, Chris Depp, Porzingis or Drew Holiday? That's a great question. Um, I think they both have impacts in different ways. Um, I think what Chris Stapp Porzingis brings is something that we haven't had as far as a big that's able to put pressure on the rim, um, also be able to stretch out and shoot, and then also be able to shoot the mid-range, also be able to get a switch and post up. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that dynamic at the big. Al's been able to stretch the floor, shooting the three. Rob was able to put pressure on the rim, but somebody that has all of that together, also add in the fact that he can protect the rim as well. Um, He's a really good defender in the drop coverage. Um, We've seen that in this preseason where he was backpedaling. He was able to get one of the yeah. lobs, got a deflection. Not too many players are able to do that. So he's going to have a, a definite impact. That's a hard question to answer because I know what Drew Holiday right. brings as a leader. Um, having championship pedigree, understanding that he'll be able to organize the offense, get guys shots where they have a live dribble, get guys in position to score. Also, his defensive prowess, his versatility on defense. So. That, that question right there, that is a burning, It's an unfair question, really. That is unfair. That's a burning <laughs> question. But the, the, the answer to that is I think they both will in yeah. different ways. You know, and that, that's where I come down on it. I mean, I, it will surprise you th- to no degree that I'm most excited to see Chris Stapp's Porzingis out there because I just think it's something the Celtics haven't had. Mm-hmm. And that's not fair to Drew Holiday, but they had Marcus Smart. And, like, while Drew might be an upgraded version of Marcus Smart in terms of, you know, maybe just being a little bit more consistent, and we'll see what happens with the three-point shot. He's got to prove that in the playoffs. But I know what Drew Holiday is going to bring and how it's going to look and how he can set a tone. And, and the championship experience is just, like, such a bonus. And I think that's going to be really impactful. But the Celtics just haven't had a seven-foot-three dude who can go in the post and get you a bucket, can work the offensive glass who can step behind the three-point arc from 25 feet and just fire over the top of all the little guys in front of them. And I think that's just going to make the offense that much more dynamic. And there were stretches last year where the Celtics were so good offensively, and it's, 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 it's almost hard to say that they can go and be even better. But just from the growth of Jason and Jalen to having these new weapons, you look at, like, I feel, how does an opposing coach look at them and go, how do you, how do you defend this? You, it's going to be hard to defend them. And then last year, you know, at, at times our offense did get bogged down. We had a situation where it was live by the three, die yeah. by the three. Well, with Rick Chris stop. And, and even Drew at yeah. this point, he's a guy that you could post up. If he gets a smaller guy on him, we've seen him post guys up, um, not only in regular season, but in playoffs, in the finals, we've seen him do that. So I, I think we have a lot of offensive versatility as well as defensive versatility. And those two players in particular – are are the catalyst of the difference that that we, we're going to have as a team this year as opposed to last year. All right, burning question number two. The biggest storyline of the preseason beyond the new additions in the locker room with Drew and Chris Stapps Porzingis and some of the new pieces on the bench has been the letter that Joe Mazzulla sent to all of you guys, inviting the legends to come back and the parade of, 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 of veterans that have come through from you and Rondo and Pierce and Satch Sanders it's been cool to see everybody come back. Take us inside that. What was that like? You know, what was that like in that email? And did you think it would play out? And, and, and just tell me through, take me through the whole experience. At first, I thought it was fake. I was like, this is a fake email. Somebody's <laughs> spamming me. But then when I started, I was like, oh, this is cool. And, and it, it's perfect to Joe's yeah. uh, personality. That's who Joe is. And that's, that's what he wants for this team. And it is important because I remember when I was here, you know, I, I was here for a couple years and you would have Jojo Weiss here. You mm. would see Hondo here. You would see, um, you know, obviously Tommy was always around. You see Satch Sanders around. So guys will come and, and that's part of the Celtic tradition is that you, 
you, you pay it forward. Mm -hmm. To understand what it is to be a Celtic, to, to wear that uniform, to go out there and play on the parquet, to lay it out there every single night for your teammates, for the fans and for the city of Boston, you know, it's to pay it forward. And that that inviting email, which that's what it was, it was very, very, very inviting. And that's the reason why you see so many guys taken to it, because it's the first time that somebody has done that. Yeah. You know, we love that. We love being around the game. You know, that's the most part. If you ask any retired player, that's the thing that we miss the most is the practices, the locker rooms, the bus rides, mm -hmm. the competition. How was that? Like you, Pierce, you launched into your own three-point contest. You kicked Sam Cassell right out of the game, told him to go work he out in the ready. post. Sam wasn't ready. Sam wasn't <laughs> ready. No, but it, it, that's fun. That's just what happens. You know, yeah. the competitive juices start happening. And then, you know, that 08 team was, you know, to say the least. We, <laughs> A different beast all yeah, the time. Yeah, we, we were something else. So, yeah. you know, whenever we get around, it doesn't matter. It's going to be some, cyber, some uh, type of competition yeah. going on. It's going to be a lot of uh, trash talking and all in the fun and all for the love of, of each other. No teaching them guys Boure or whatever. No, 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 we don't want to take their money. Let them stay there. Even though they got a lot of money, they can yes. take it. But let them stay their money, man. All right, well, that brings me to question number three. The biggest thing coming into the season for me is, like, how the Celtics handle expectations, right? Like, they are going to be championship favorites. They're going to hear every day about how good they should be, and yet you can't skip steps. you got to go out there and do it every day. You guys felt a little bit of that in 2008, right? Like, the big three comes together, and there were question marks. But you kind of figured it out, and it was quick. Like, you guys were just really from that Madrid trip and all that just kind of launched. Like, what, 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 how can this year's team handle expectations, and how do you think they will? Well, going to Italy where we yeah. went, we went to Italy and we went to London, that, those were, that was key because it, was, it forced us to all hang with each other. You know what I mean? It, it, the team was thrown together. Um, and we had expectations, but we wanted those. That, that's what we expected. Right. Whatever anybody else was talking about, we didn't care about that. We expected what we expected, and we know what we had to do to go out there and make that happen. I think this team is taking that same mentality, you know, talking to all of the guys. You know, on media day when guys came through, we were doing that live stream, and we had an opportunity to talk to every single player. And then I talked to players on the side, off camera, and things like that. Hearing their mentality and what they really believe and how they are going about their work, they have that men they have the mindset of hey man we have a standard mm -hmm. it's not what you guys expect it's not what outside noise expects it's what we expect and we're going to hold each other accountable to that standard and that right there to me that's the that's the beginning that's the seed that's planted now they just got to continue mm -hmm. to uh, to water it continue to nurture that and watch it grow do you worry at all? Like, I think about 2019, they had a loaded roster, never quite figured out how to, like, everybody sacrificed. You know, no one was willing in that moment. Different group this year. I think there's much more likelihood because Porzingis has been through, you know, being in, in NBA hell in, in, in Washington and, and Drew's been on championship teams. I think they're better equipped to handle the pressure. But do you have, as a player, do you have to, like, get to a point where you're just willing to sacrifice and, and all that to, 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 to really have it all come together? Well, in 2019, think about how young those guys yeah. were. You know, when, when you're young, you're just trying to – first off, it's two things you're trying to do. You're trying to just figure out how the, the league works. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to figure out how do you get your money. How do I fit in this league? What do I need to do? Everybody's got their money now. Right. Yeah. So, so it's a different mindset, you know. Mm -hmm. So now the mindset is, okay, we've been in the league for a while. We're veterans. Even though they're still young, they understand exactly what it takes. They've been knocking on the door, tapping. Now it's time to just <laughs> kick the dough down mm -hmm. and go through there. And, and I think that's the mentality that they have because – when you're young, you're a young player, you're looking for certain things. You know, you're just looking for self-satisfaction. You're trying to just make sure that you secure the bag for your family. But once you've done those things, now when, when it really pivots to just winning, mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't want to always, because I, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to do this compared to teams to 08, but the sure. 08 team was full of veterans, guys who, have already right. secured the bag, had did all the, had all. That was success. all you guys were focused on, right? Only thing yeah. was winning the championship and what can we do? So you, you, be, you have this selfless uh, mindset, yep. you know what I mean? And, and, and on Ubuntu, I think the, the thing that Doc did with that was he really focused on that Team word work, yeah. and it was teamwork. It was 
chemistry, camaraderie, and I can't be the best I can be unless I make you mm -hmm. the best that you could be. And so I think those things all incorporate. It, it's the same thing. Even though they're not yelling Ubuntu, one, yep. two, three, and Ubuntu, I believe they have that same mentality. But when you're over there, you need to just flash that ring, and then you, <laughs> and then you just tell them a little bit about Ubuntu, just so they, that they, they know what they're working towards. All right, we're recording this after we did our Celtic season preview show. We kicked Chris Mannix out of here because he was just being too negative, and we couldn't bring that on the Celtics Talk podcast. But I do have to ask you this, the, the one question that most elicited his rage. Number four, are you concerned at all about the depth? You're, you seem pretty bullish on the fact that their six is good enough and, their eight, and the eight that they can lean on in the playoffs will be enough to get you through. Uh, you, I think you share some of our concerns about the depth and at the big man spot, but you, you're, you're pretty confident in this group. Yeah, I feel like if you put our six next to any other six in the NBA, I feel like we have that best six. Um, I feel like we have versatility defensively and we have versatility offensively, which to me makes us better from one through six than everybody else. Now, when you start getting to seven, eight, nine, we, we're, we're going to need another big yeah. just to, to lean on, you know, to get fast. And we're not looking for somebody to come in that's going to change, but he might change a game. Yeah. Somebody that you could depend on for 15 minutes that gives you a positive, uh, a positive results and, and, and helps the team in a certain way, whether it be rebounding, whether it be blocking shots, whether it be taking a, a charge, or whether it be just a guy that's out there really setting great screens, mm. getting Jason open, getting Jalen open, getting guys wide open shots. Whatever it is, we, we eventually. I don't think right now. I think you you test the waters. You look yep. and see how the how the first you know maybe quarter of the season mm -hmm. goes by. See how that goes. And you know when we start talking about December, we'll know then. I think in December, right in December, going into the new year, we'll know at that point. Right after Christmas, we'll say, "Hell, you know what? Yep. This is what we maybe need." Or you know what? No, we're good. Mm -hmm. We just need to add something just for depth. And we have the flexibility. Um, you know, we have one more roster spot. We have that trade exception to where we could go, you know, spend a little bit of money or whatever we got to do to do it um, to, to, to fill that void. And that's the great thing about what Brad Stevens has done. You know, not only has he been able to restructure this mm -hmm. roster and always restructure the roster in ways to be a success, but always have itself with opportunity to do more and not just be like, hey, yeah. we're all in on that. So uh, great job by Brad Stevens. Yeah, December 15th is the date that a lot of the people they signed this offseason, some of those wings that if you feel like, well, you just have too many wings, maybe you can help cobble together a trade. You mentioned the Grant Williams TPE. That's six and a half million dollars in that range to go potentially seek somebody. The other wild card I'll throw out there, and because as you were talking, and I started thinking, and I hate that we're, I'm like invariably going back to 2008, but I, I do think it's a good way to like mentally go through this exercise about how what they had, what you guys had versus what this team had. Uh, PJ Brown came to mind, mm -hmm. you know, like look, and the obvious comp here is Blake Griffin. I don't know if Blake's going to stay retired. I don't know if Blake's going to latch on with an LA team. Like we'll see what happens. The guys are not bugging him. They understand how good it was to have that veteran presence around last season, and he is the sort of the perfect backup big that you can just throw in there. He's actually defended Giannis really well in the past. Like, you, there's a reason you could potentially see, like, hey, can we get you for the last half of the season? But someone of that ilk. It doesn't have to necessarily be a big, hulking big, you know, but someone who can just help eat minutes at that center position when Al Horford rests, when Kristaps Porzingis needs a night off. I think there's ways to get through, and you can probably wait till December to, to figure that out. For number five, I had to need some helps from our friends at Fanatic Sportsbook because one of the questions I had is, I wonder, what, big conversation right now, where does Jason Tatum rank in the MVP conversation? So right now on Fanatic Sportsbook, he is fourth, plus 750. Pretty good odds for, you know, considering how good the Celtics should be. The people in front of him, Nikola Jokic plus 450, Luka Doncic plus 500, and Giannis plus 500. Tatum's actually ahead of Embiid at plus 900, but that's because Philadelphia is a little bit of a mess and they got to figure some stuff out. Uh, but, let, but just when you think about it, What's the pathway for Jason Tatum to be MVP? Is it enough to be the best player on the best team? Does, is there something like statistical he has to do? Does he still have to average 30 points per game? Like how does Tatum muscle his way through the Jokic's and Doncic's of the world? Well, you know, the funny thing about the MVP, the goalpost moves every year. Yeah. You don't know what the criteria is. You know, it usually was the best player on the best team or if somebody had a, a historical type of, of year yep. like a uh, uh, Russell Westbrook when he had the triple, triple double, double um, you know last year in beat got mm -hmm. the way he was scoring the basketball that so if, if you're not doing if you're not doing those things and your team's not winning I, t t it's 
it's it's hard to figure out how. That's why Luca, Luke, like Luca, was never in the conversation to me last year because like they weren't good enough as a team. And I don't think that he was doing anything that was historical. Right. He was just balling out. Yeah. Like he was balling. So you were like, he hooping, but that <laughs> that that's not equating the wins, yeah. and it's not nothing that's historical. So. I mean, those three guys that are in front of him, they all deserve uh, mm-hmm. to, to get that credit and, and, and to get that recognition of, of being there. But to me, I think for, for Jason Tatum to win, it has to be a, a team thing. Yeah. The team has to go out there, win 60-something games, get the number one seed, and really be the best team in the league by far where mm-hmm. everybody knows. And he going to do what he does. His numbers are always going to re- are, are, are yeah. be a reflection of how great he is. Because, I mean, he's a guy to go out there and could give you 50, you know, he's going to give you 30. He would average. What did he average? Damn near 30 last 30 year? Over, 30 over. First Celtic player to yeah. average over 30 points. So he averaged 30 last year. That's not saying that he's going to go out and average 30 again. But if he's in that 28, 27, 27 28, 29, and we have 60 some wins, mm-hmm. we're the best team in the NBA. And also on top of that, what he's talking about being a better defensive player. Yes. Then you start looking at like those things might come into play, and that's possibly how he could uh, end up winning. That, that to me is what is sort of the key, right? Like if he's an all defense guy, if he is using that 12 pounds of new muscle to be in the post and like get easier baskets and not just have to rely on it on his great shooting, like those are pathways to me that that, that suggests. But I do think you're right. I think they got to be light years ahead of what other teams are because everyone's going to look at it and go, well. He's got Jalen Brown. He's got Chris Stapps. He's got Drew. And that's the point to where I was getting ready to make. If he's making other guys better as right. well, as opposed to he's getting his, he's not getting no, he's not really making anybody around him better, but he's Ding up. He's getting his and he's making other people better. Then, and they have, we have the best record. Then you have to look at like, okay, that's exactly the pathway for him to get the MVP. All right. Powered by Fanatic Sportsbook, where you can earn 5% fan cash on your best. We'll see if those odds start to climb as the season gets rolling. Eddie, let's end on this. How are you feeling? Like, what, what, like what, is, what, what, what do you want to see on opening night in New York that would make you feel really good about where the season is headed? I want to see them come out and say, hey, make a statement. I think. Game one is always a statement, but I think the first month of the season is a statement month. It's where you come out and say, man, I don't care who we're playing. I don't care where it's at. I don't care if it's a team that's not supposed to be in the playoffs or if it's it's the team and we're on primetime TV. This is what you're going to get from the Boston Celtics night in and night out. And it's effort, defense, playing together, sharing the basketball, and kicking ass. So I want to see that. <laughs> how, do they, how do they get that defensive mindset? Well, it's, it's them. Like, how do they get it? It has to start from the tip. It has to, it's been, I believe, actually, to be honest with you, I think it started in training camp. Mm. You know, I, I've seen how they've been getting after each other. Um, you've heard Jason Tatum. You've heard Jalen yeah. Brown. You've heard everybody say, man, practice has been hard as hell. You know, we've been really getting after it. And I heard, I, I missed one of the practices. I came the ne- following day. They didn't go as hard. But everybody was like, man, yesterday was one of those mm. days. And those are the building blocks. Mm-hmm. Those are the building blocks. So when you finally do go see somebody else, you, you, you ready to go see them. And your work that you put in is, is so much easier on the court because you guys are locked in. You guys are in lockstep. You guys understand what, what the task is. So to me, it's about going out there and having the, the mindset of we are the best team. And we're going to start from – it's going to start game one, and it's not going to end until we hoist that trophy. If, uh, if they need any more motivation, every time Eddie slams his right hand down and that ring just glistens in my eyes, I think, man, they, 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 that, that's all you need to see. Yeah, Jason, Jalen, you want to be a legend here in Boston? You want to get all the free dinners that Eddie gets when he goes out and about on the table? I wish I got the free dinners. If anybody's <laughs> how watching, scale, man, hook me up with some dinners. How does how to scale get all the free stuff and, like, you know? Like. Scale seven feet tall, I'll be in. That's why, man. <laughs> All right, let's get this party started. Everybody stick around for the post-game pods coming up this week. We'll be back with you Wednesday night after Celtics and Knicks. Remember, later Friday, the home opener. We'll all be over at the Garden. It's going to be a bunch of fun. Eddie, let's get this thing going. Let's go Celtics. Check us out on the YouTube page. Let's like, subscribe Celtics. on your favorite podcast app. We'll catch you next time on let's the Celtics go Talk Podcast. Celtics. Look no further than the award-winning 24 24- Group with over 2,600 vehicles in stock, the brands you love, backed by the savings and service you can count on. Visit today or shop online at 24autogroup.com. One last thing before we get out of here Wednesday night also marks the first game of Mike Gorman's final season on the mic 43 years. Our Abby Chain got a chance to catch up with Mike before the season tips to just talk about what's ahead in his final season.
So many moments, Mike, as we go into your final season. I'm still a little emotional about it. How are you feeling? A little emotional about it, too. Um, it's going to be interesting the closer it gets. Right now, it, it hasn't really hit me, except the fact that when they go away, I don't do any work anymore, which is kind of nice, actually, at my age. But uh, it is. I, I don't want to be out on the road at 4 o'clock in the morning stripping snow off my car. You know about that. We've done that Fair, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so, yeah, I, I'm excited right now. It'll be interesting as we get down to March and April, uh, how I'll feel then when knowing that maybe the second, especially in the playoffs, I don't know, but that'll be my last games that I'll do. So, but that's still a long way off. Yes, yes, it is. I'm, and I'm not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you look back on the four plus decades yeah. of your career and time as the voice of the Boston Celtics, what are some of your fondest memories? It's the people I met mostly. Uh, games come and go. Uh, you know, some guys have these photographic type memories, and I say, well, I remember that Sunday afternoon game in 1968 or something like that. I, when I get, after game's over, I forget it completely. But I don't forget the relationships that I've been with you, relationships I've been able to Paul Lucy, Jim Edmonds, two guys in the truck who just do an amazing job, Mark over here. Everybody is just really, really good at what they do, and it's been a pleasure to work with them all. Uh, and it makes it fun to come to work. The game sometimes almost becomes secondary to that. So, um, again, there'll be players I won't see four or five years from now. Hopefully you, others, I will. It'll be nice to say goodbye to the people who have been so good through all this time and provide all the information. You know, without these guys, we'd be lost going into a game. So, um, to Dick Lives of the World, thank you. You're absolutely right. The relationships that you've built over the years, what stands out to you in this business that can be so tough sometimes? And how have you been able? I don't think there will be another like you. You're a one of yeah. one. Well, thank you. Um, actually, I'm one of two. A guy named Heinsohn. Uh, he probably is the biggest influence I had in my career. Um, just a heck of a guy. Um, taught me a lot. I could sit here for hours and tell you how he taught me to get around, how to deal with the NBA, and to deal with press people, and to deal with the other team, and deal with officials. Taught me knew how to do all that and did it very well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been interesting these last four or five years doing the games myself, uh, relatively speaking. A scout won't let me say that. But, uh, um, yeah, I, Tommy has been an amazing factor in my life, and um, his, his number in the rafters is really where he belongs. Before we close this out, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. Favorite player you've watched? Paul Pierce. No question about it. I, I, I like, you know, that's probably because I was there at the beginning. I mean, I, I literally did his last game at the University of Kansas. At Kansas. Uh, uh, so um, yeah, I've been working with Paul all along the way. Uh, he's a character. He's a good kid. Uh, he's back working with the team, which is really good to see. But um, yeah, he's the, he's the guy if I want to go have a beer with, I'd, I'd go with Paul. I think that's a good assessment. <laughs> Although, I looked it up. You have seen 14 Naismith ba Basketball Hall of Famers wow. in your time. Really? So, wow. yes, 14. That'd be a great trivia question. <laughs> I just won. <laughs> I did win the lottery, getting to work with you all these years. So, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you.